Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually, although it's a shame not to be here physically, but that's a sign of the times that we're in. Uh, as Matthew said, what I'm going to talk about today is, is very topical. Uh, before I say anything else, I think it's worth pointing out that right now our network is not a particularly environmentally friendly form of transport uh, because all our trains are running around empty and that's obviously a huge concern for the industry but as far as this topic's concerned I certainly firmly believe that the whole issue of climate change is a very long-term project so it's I believe it's reasonable to use pre-COVID figures to talk about rail's environmental record. A little bit about myself and why I find myself quite involved and interested in this particular subject. Uh, 2012, I saw the UK's first hydrogen train at the, uh, at the Railway Challenge, which uh, some of you will have been to, which is a, a remarkable event. And what is remarkable about it, or one of the things remarkable about it, is the opportunity to, to trial things you wouldn't normally see on the mainline railway. And so it was that the University of Birmingham presented their uh, first UK's hydrogen train. And if you told me then, five years later, that I would have actually been taking a ride in a full-size passenger hydrogen train, I would not have believed you at the time, to be frank, but things have moved on. Uh, and the development of hydrogen fuel cells over the past 20 years or so has been quite dramatic to give us essentially a new form of traction, which is a topical one, but, but as we know, it's not, it's not the main solution, but it certainly is one of great interest. Before I talk about the situation on the railway, I think it's always best to step back and get the overview because it's important to see rail decarbonisation in the context of UK decarbonisation. Uh, and the UK can be quite proud of, of the Climate Change Act, uh, a world first with a legally committing uh, commitment to reduce emissions. Initially, it was to be an 80% reduction by 2050. Uh, but the Committee for Climate Change uh, put a report in 2019, uh, which said that net zero was achievable uh, in a report they produced uh, on how to achieve net zero which I found quite illuminating because it explained the technologies uh, that were required uh, to achieve that and we'll, we'll come to that. Uh, so the UK set itself some quite, quite tight targets and actually has, has achieved some significant levels of emissions uh, reductions as we can see there, uh, particularly in power. Uh, the, I mean, it's quite extraordinary to think that we're not burning any coal for those of us that are used to seeing uh, long trains of coals going to power stations. Uh, so there's been significant progress reducing emissions since 1990, but not in transport. Uh, and this graph here and these figures here considers all transport, uh, international uh, air travel and ships. And ships. Yeah. The, excuse me, I'm getting a bit of an echo here, is that a problem? So it, consider, it considers uh, transport, as we can see, rail is a very small part of that. Uh, but as we will see, rail has got the potential to do more than just reduce its own emissions. One of the ways of looking at this problem is to see how we use our energy. Uh, I find this quite a fascinating diagram. It's freely available online, the energy, UK energy flowchart. But essentially what this shows is that uh, in terms of terawatt hours, 350 uh, terawatt hours was our electricity production in 2018. Petroleum for transport is 640. And of course the vision is to move, wean transport off petroleum and actually well, use electricity to, to power transport. Uh, and that's quite challenging for all manner of reasons. The national grid uh, have got uh, a vision that we'll come to, but let's look at the, the role of electricity. Electricity is really the only large scale net zero uh, 
option for surface transport. Uh, but the point about electricity, of course, is it can only be transmitted to fixed locations. And electricity cannot really be stored. It needs to be converted into another form of energy. And energy is always lost during such energy conversions. And frankly, nothing, when we come to storing energy, nothing comes close to the amount of energy you can store in petroleum. One option that's mentioned is biofuels, uh, which have a role. But what the Committee for Climate Change came concluded was that genuine biofuels are a very finite and limited resource uh, because they have carbon associated with them. And if you displace land used for growing crops, that also creates its own problems. So the Committee for Climate Change concluded that at best by 2050, you would, you would have a scenario where biofuels could be equivalent to about 14% of current petroleum production. So you'd want to use those for strictly limited uh, uh, options where, for example, aviation where there isn't any alternative, for example. And here's a view of the future that National Grid have come up with in one of their future energy scenarios, which essentially shows uh, pretty much everything powered by electricity apart from a substantial part of hydrogen and biofuels, biofuels being used for aviation and shipping. Uh, it is felt that hydrogen has a part to play in the economy because it, it's a more flexible energy carrier than electricity is, but clearly it's got a number of practical uh, problems that go with it, as we'll come to. Before we actually turn to trains, let's look at what's sort of happening uh, in the field of hydrogen anyway. Uh, in other sectors. On the roads, uh, Scotland got its first hydrogen bin lorry in 2016 uh, and Glasgow is now about to get 19 hydrogen powered refuse trucks. Uh, interestingly, the power hydrogen powertrain for those refuse trucks are being used on Scotland's uh, hydrogen train that's now being uh, converted. Uh, we have a number of hydrogen bus projects and HGVs uh, are an interesting issue. Uh, if you recall the chart uh, of emissions for transport, HGVs have got about 10 times total rail emissions and they're a huge subject. And the Committee for Climate Change commissioned Ricardo to do quite an in-depth study on the likelihood and the issues associated with HGVs. They considered a number of options, which even included putting wires up over the motorways uh, and hydrogen and battery. And the issue, not surprisingly perhaps, is that the biggest factor is not so much the vehicles, but the infrastructure. And interestingly, their scenarios showed that although the fuel cost, if you're using batteries, is uh, about 50% lower than hydrogen, basically the hydrogen infrastructure is cheaper than the infrastructure you need to actually charge batteries because of the sheer power uh, needed to supply that. Uh, so their conclusion was that if you consider the infrastructure, hydrogen was probably uh, the overall lowest cost. Uh, let's move on. In the air, uh, aerospace are very seriously considering liquid hydrogen fuel planes. Uh, which might sound a bit futuristic because right now the only thing that uses liquid hydrogen are space rockets. Uh, but it has, in fact, it probably it is the only option for real high powered uh, aviation. Uh, and we'll touch on why. On the ships, on the sea, ammonia would seem to be the preferred solution because although it's poisonous, ammonia is actually a very good way of storing large volumes of hydrogen if you've got a space and the plant to do it. Uh, and not only that, ammonia, if, it, if you've got the right catalysts and such like, can be burnt directly in, in diesel engines. Uh, so there's a few options there. And this here gives a feel for how you store hydrogen. Uh, the preferred technology on trains is 350 bar uh, cylinder storage, which is about 8% of the uh, energy of diesel. Uh, 
Uh, but as you can see, if we touch on the hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, which I can't see anybody using on uh, on trains, but it actually has got a very high percentage, well, 26%, which is high anyway, uh, of energy for the air, for the volume. And actually, because it's lighter, which is critical for planes, uh, you get much more energy uh, from hydrogen than you do from diesel. Uh, but let's... That's a bit of an overview, a bit of a background. Let's turn to rail. And I suppose the time that decarbonisation really became topical was when Joe Johnson gave his speech uh, saying he would like to take diesel. Well, it was reported as taking diesel trains off the tracks, but he actually said diesel only because he was wanting to keep bi modes operating. Uh, and he was talking about alternative fuel trains, etc. And he provide he called on the railway to provide a vision on how to decarbonise. Uh, but in doing so, the industry's hands were rather tied, uh, because as you'll see there, uh, RSSB in one of their reports uh, noted that the government made it clear that when it came to decarbonisation, they wanted innovative solutions rather than electrification, which does rather. Uh, uh, d deny the the obvious option. Anyway, a, a rail industry task force was set up to report, uh, uh, a, and it was supposed to report in October 18. Uh, and here it is. The final report came out uh, a year later in July 19. Uh, it was a 68-page report, lots and lots of information. Uh, the first bit uh, was the exec summary. Uh, and on page five, they concluded that a judicious mix of cost-effective electrification uh, was needed. Uh, buried on page 34 was a statement that you needed uh, 4,000 root kilometres electrifying, which didn't really come out of the exec summary at all. Uh, I find that quite surprising, actually. There's a lot of good stuff in that report, but there isn't much information that's clearly presented. And it recommended a further study, the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy that Network Rail undertook. Uh, in contrast, this report was much more specific. Uh, as you can see on the, the right there, it recommended a very large amount of electrification, a little bit of hydrogen, slightly less battery, and about 300 uh, standard uh, uh, track kilometres, uh, for which they hadn't actually come to a conclusion. And they actually clearly spelt out all the benefits associated with electrification, made the point that it was actually a very good investment. Uh, it considered a range of costs, including those that have been experienced on, on Great Western, and it considered current electrification costs. And it came up with a range of uh, returns on your investment, the minus 2.5 billion was at Great Western electrification costs, but at current electrification costs and current schemes, uh, it has a positive business case. Uh, and so that was quite a strong report explaining the benefits of electrification. It came out in July last year, and government is still officially to respond to that, uh, but nothing seems to have been authorised since then. Uh, not south of the border, that is, anyway. Uh, and one of the things, it talks about modal shifts. Let's, let's look at rail's potential contribution. Because as I said earlier, rail's emissions is a tiny fraction of the overall transport thing, but it can do much more than just save its own emissions. If we look at that table there, that's the 2018 emissions. And the... Uh, emissions per per passenger mile or per ton mile, uh, as you can see there, uh, rail is about a third that of a car, about a fifth that as as a plane. Uh, when you take the total passenger travel against the total emissions, and for freight, if you compare it with HGVs, uh, rail is about nine times more carbon efficient. So let's see what would happen if we actually played around with those figures and stuck them on the spreadsheet uh, and considered some different modal transport options. Let's say a 5% on passengers, 5% modal shift from rail, 25% from air. Uh, 
and what you get there is uh, an overall UK passenger saving of 2.8 uh, million tonnes of carbon, which is actually greater than rail's emissions. However, what that does mean is it increases the amount of passenger traffic by 45%. And as, as I mentioned earlier, by the way, I am talking about pre-COVID here, uh, but we have to look to the long term. So that means that if rail is to accept that uh, modal shift, rail needs things like HS2, capacity enhancements and such like. And similarly with freight, similar figures. So if you add up that, you, you get a total modal shift saving of uh, almost twice rail's current emissions. And I think those are quite interesting statistics. They're a bit on the theoretical side, but it does give an indication of the sort of role that rail can play over and above just saving its emissions. So let's look at our various different types of, uh, of transport and consider them specifically. Let's consider electrification. Electrification, rail is unique in having the only high powered zero carbon uh, transport technology because rail is using electricity as it is generated. The electrification equipment is fixed so rail can actually absorb electricity from the national grid as it is generated without any uh, without any uh, conversions. Uh, it is therefore a future-proof technology. Uh, it's, it's not possible to think of anything that can be more efficient than taking energy and feeding it straight into, uh, into the traction motors. And that's something that sadly the industry has not been able to communicate to some of our decision makers. And the other problem that rail has got as far as electrification is that we have to restore confidence. Sadly, and for whatever reason, uh, the early electrification, the early tranche of the current electrification schemes were way over budget and the government lost confidence in the ability of the industry to deliver. Uh, there were some mistakes made and it Perhaps was not surprising if you look at the graph there on the bottom right in terms of how much electrification was being delivered after doing nothing for about 20 years. Uh, it's not surprising that it took time for the industry to ramp up uh, experience. But nevertheless, government lost confidence. A lot of good work has been done to explain why and learn lessons. Uh, and there's some really good cost saving initiatives that's been developed to bring the cost of electrification down and look at it along as a production basis so that electrification can be delivered uh, in a much more cost effective way. Uh, but nevertheless, the industry does need to restore confidence. Uh, one of the things I, I found interesting when I was, was researching previous electrifications and such like, uh, Network Rail produced a electrification route utilization study in October 2009 from which you can compute the cost an electric vehicles uh, lifetime savings is somewhere between two and three million pounds over a passenger vehicles lifetime and also what was quite interesting in 2007 there was a very powerful letter that was jointly signed by Adrian Shooter who was chairman of ATOC at the time and Ian Coucher just on two pages that spelt out the arguments for electrification and that actually turned the tide uh, and it was quite interesting to compare that two-page letter with the 68-page decarbonisation report that came out. Uh, I thought it was quite powerful but sadly the message hasn't got across. The Transport Select Committee I listened to last November contained quite a number of statements that, that showed that our decision makers don't understand the basic physics behind uh, electrification. Uh, hydrogen isn't quite there yet and how can we be sure that uh, there will not be a better technology in electrification and diesel was wrong so electrification could be wrong. Uh, the cost of the thing being brought up uh, and Somehow we have to educate our politicians. I think if we're going to get an electrification program back, 
But somebody asked why there was a different approach in Scotland on that committee, uh, which is a very interesting question because uh, living in Scotland, I do find it quite weird that we do have a commitment in Scotland, as you can see. Uh, Scotland has a rail decarbonisation plan that is going to electrify pretty much all of the Scottish network uh, by about 2035, except for rural routes. And what I find interesting is that the initiative for that actually came from Transport Scotland, which is the equivalent of the Department for Transport. Uh, and without any meaty reports or whatever, the people in Transport Scotland have convinced the Scottish ministers to spend scarce funds on a large scale electrification programme, which they uh, have managed to persuade the government that that's the best way that Scotland's railway can benefit the people of Scotland. And I'm too far from the DFT to be aware of what's said in the DFT, but you do get the impression that there isn't the understanding of that in order that ministers can be convinced. And that's the big challenge that the industry faces. The other thing that I found out recently, which is really, uh, I hadn't realised this, although the UK rail has got an excellent uh, carbon record, when it's compared with other railways, it's got actually, frankly, quite a poor car carbon record. Uh, rail has got amongst the world's worst uh, CO2 emissions when we make comparisons with other railways, uh, as you can see there. And the reason for that is because diesel is a particularly high percentage of UK traction energy. Uh, appreciated it was bad for freight, but I didn't realise quite how bad it was for passengers. So if you compare it with Europe, for example, over 50% of our traction energy comes from diesel as opposed to about 25% in Europe. Uh, and I found those charts really quite interesting. Uh, and it, it, it demonstrates again uh, the benefits of electrification. I doubt very much whether I've got to convince anybody in the audience of the, of the benefits of electrification, but as I say, the challenge is explaining that to decision makers. So let's move on. Uh, one uh, relatively modern traction innovation is bimode traction. And there we have uh, the Inverness to King's Cross train just going over the Culloden Viaduct. Uh, bimodes uh, have got pros and they've got cons. Uh, and they do have benefits, certainly short term benefits. When the uh, bimode running, the Azumas were introduced between uh, Inverness and King's Cross. Uh, they probably had about a third of the emissions of the HSTs they replace because you instantly reduce diesel running under the wires. They're not a long-term decarbonisation option, but they do bring benefits. Uh, clearly, it's not a good idea to have 8% uh, uh, of the weight of the train uh, with, a, with a diesel engine on running under electric wires for a long term. But in the, sh in the short term, it does give you savings. The other thing about bimodes is it gives you traction flexibility that can facilitate a rolling program. Uh, in the days when you had to electrify the route all at once to get electric trains introduced, that actually meant you had to do a lot of electrification in one hit. Whereas, as we, as we know, a rolling program is the best way of doing electrification. So, bimodes offer a traction which reduces uh, in the short term uh, running under the wires and also uh, it gives you fairly high powered electric traction but not uh, high powered uh, diesel traction uh, so they should be regarded a short term benefit uh, they're certainly not the the wonder solution that they were proposed when the middle and main line uh, electrification was cancelled Let's move on now to, to batteries and to hydrogen and look at uh, storage constraints. Uh, and what I've done there is that graph there looks at how you'd store the same amount of energy on a typical diesel rail coach uh, in terms of the inter passenger interior space for the volume and the weight uh, of, of the vehicle. And 
those graphs show quite clearly uh, that both batteries and hydrogen are not very good at storing energy compared with diesel. We were always, I mean, the world has been spoiled by, by petroleum in terms of how much energy you can store within it. Uh, it does show that as of right now, hydrogen at 350 bar, uh, you can store probably twice the amount of energy on train as you can uh, with a battery. Uh, the Advanced Propulsion Centre anticipate that by 2035, batteries should just offer the same storage by volume as hydrogen at 350 bar, but uh, the weight is still going to be a problem. Uh, and those are those are real issues that we need to we need to uh, accept and acknowledge. So let's look at batteries. Uh, there's uh, the Vivo train. Uh, currently the only type approved uh, battery train uh, operational in the UK. Uh, and there's a number of uh, initiatives on the go. Uh, Itachi are in talks with uh, LNER to replace diesel power packs with batteries for short services uh, off the wires, say to Lincoln and such like. And Viva Rail have got uh, quite a good uh, interesting innovations their fast charging system is potentially a game changer uh, because using batteries that are specially cooled to accommodate the high recharge current uh, using third and fourth rails to transmit that current and having uh, a, a trickle charge battery bank to deliver the high powered charging uh, a viva rail battery train can be recharged in just under 10 minutes. And there are perhaps some certain long distance services where if you stop the train for 10 minutes every 100 miles, that will be acceptable. So that's, that's an interesting option that's, that's worthy of consideration. Uh, but nevertheless, the TDNS concluded that batteries uh, were a relatively small scale option uh, in the long term. But in the short term, they offer a lot of benefits because battery EMU hybrids can actually offer you a short term electrification before you do full electrification, which I understand is the approach in Scotland. And let's turn to hydrogen. Hydrogen trains that we have, we have three now uh, proposals for hydrogen trains in the UK, and there's Alstom's Island. Uh, Hydrogen storage is a particular issue in the UK. The island has its uh, hydrogen tanks on the roof, uh, which don't fit, uh, it would seem, in the UK. Hence the breeze, which is a, uh, a conversion, is proposing to store hydrogen in the train. It may be possible to actually build uh, a train, a UK train that doesn't store hydrogen inside the train, but that would probably require a bespoke uh, UK hydrogen train that would require a long production run. And one of the things that's important to acknowledge uh, is that rail's actually a small player as far as hydrogen is concerned. Uh, the Committee for Climate Change assessed likely demand for, for hydrogen. And as you can see on there, uh, HGVs will be about 22 terawatt hours compared with 0.3 for, for trains. So HGVs will probably need 60 times as much hydrogen as trains would. Uh, but the thing about rail is that the vehicle lives are much longer. So rail needs to make a start maybe a bit earlier. Uh, and rail's got the option to benefit from synergies from other sectors. Uh, for example, I did mention the Glasgow bin lorry. Uh, Arcola, who's the company who's developing Scotland's hydrogen train, their role is an integrator of, of hydrogen systems, so they produce hydrogen powertrains, uh, and that's what's going to be fitted to the class 314 you can see there. Interesting to see how they've been developed. I did mention the, uh, the first train in the UK in 2012. Uh, Alstom's train uh, entered service in September 18. Uh, it's, as all hydrogen trains are, it's a hydrogen battery hybrid. Because uh, the point being is that fuel cells generally work well when you've got uh, a steady output. And one of the things that I was advised by, by Alstom is that the thing that was 
one of the most difficult and challenging things about developing the hydrogen train was the control system to balance the fuel cell output, the traction uh, battery output and, and input from the braking and such like. Uh, but they've, they've certainly got a product now that can be, can be regarded as uh, a mature technology. Uh, and also have got proposals to actually introduce that in the UK. They came up with their proposals in 2019 uh, I know all some are in developments with Northern to, with a view to operating a fleet of trains which could be converted at their Widnes facility uh, out of the hydrogen hub on the T side, uh, but as yet uh, there's no announcement of any uh, fleet operation, but hopefully something might come soon. Hydrogen is not particularly efficient either. Uh, it's probably the same efficiency as a diesel engine to put it in context however so that's the efficiency of of a typical efficiencies uh of, of a hydrogen train from uh from generating electricity to actually putting it uh, to the wheel and as you can see you've got electrolysis you've got us lose a little bit of energy when you store it uh you've got a little bit of loss in the fuel cell and then you've got the conversion and drive 32 percent efficiency obviously that needs extra power but is that an issue uh, a few things to consider here actually first of all hydrogen's energy vector uh, it uh, provides the opportunity for grid balancing so you can certainly take advantage of overnight wind power the other point uh, I had quite interesting conversation with uh, dr ben to todd uh, who's of our coal energy uh, who, who advised me that apparently there's a lot of uh, wind power projects that are currently constrained for lack of demand and it's things like hydrogen that could create that demand and then the other thing is price certainty because the cost of hydrogen is essentially the cost of the kit once you've actually bought the electrolyzer and you've invested in the turbine or whatever that is the capital cost and maintenance cost is your cost of the hydrogen and what I found interesting is Alstom's recent hydrogen uh, contract not only included 25 years of maintenance but 25 years of fuel which I would suggest is pretty unprecedented and it does show that there's actual certainty a fuel cost for a company to actually commit to provide fuel for its trains for 25 years uh, so there's an illustration of you know you've got the price certainty there so <clears throat> in certain situations maybe that efficiency uh, poor efficiency isn't such a big deal when compared with uh, electric trains. <coughs> How do you supply hydrogen? How do you move it? Uh, three choices in pipelines. In tankers, you would need a lot more of them because hydrogen hasn't got the energy density. Uh, a typical HGV would supply enough hydrogen for, say, five rail cars whereas normally you would supply 60 diesel cars. So you'd need 12 times as many hydrogen tankers as you do need diesel tankers right now. Or the best way perhaps of doing it, certainly for uh, depots where you've got back to base type operations for hydrogen vehicles is actually using the fact it's an energy vector and using electricity to generate hydrogen at the depot. Uh, there was, uh, quite a successful and interesting hydrogen bus pilot in Aberdeen. Aberdeen at one stage had the world's biggest bus fleet of 10 buses for which it had its own electrolyzer plant and they concluded that electrolyzers are a mature scalable and reliable technology. Uh, the belief is that the price of electrolyzers will continue to decrease and as we said earlier it offers grid balancing opportunities and there's uh, Aberdeen's uh, hydrogen refueling station, which at one stage was Europe's busiest highly, uh, hydrogen refueling station. Uh, it has three electrolyzers, which are in essentially 40 foot containers, uh, compressors, dispensers, various control systems and cooling plant and, and storage. And it required about a megawatt uh, supply to provide about 300 kilograms of hydrogen a day. Uh, if you if you scale that up, uh, you would need ten times that uh, to supply uh, trains. So if you're supplying, that's to supply ten buses. Uh, 
if you multiply it by 10, roughly, that's your ballpark figure uh, to supply trains. So you're probably talking about 15, 20 million quid for a plant to supply uh, 10 trains. Uh, and hydrogen trains have got enough range to go out from the depot and back in a day. Uh, so that's that's the way that hydrogen could be supplied. The other thing that we, we really should consider, and I think it's quite important, is modifying existing trains. Uh, with the best one in the world, electrification, introducing new hydrogen fleet, whatever, will take time. In the meantime, we've got lots of trains that could be modified to produce uh, worthwhile savings. Uh, one interesting initiative, which very sadly has not actually come to fruition because Grand Central, unfortunately, uh, have not, were hit badly by the pandemic and didn't get the opportunity to try this, but was a dual fuel system uh, on the class 180 uh, that was gonna burn liquid natural gas as well as diesel. And as you can see there, with some quite impressive uh, potential rebut, uh, results uh, with a five-year payback. So that's the sort of thing that perhaps we should be focusing as well in the transition period uh, to reduce our carbon. It's not all about looking at the, uh, the long result. And the other uh, initiative uh, is, is introducing uh, hybrid trains. Uh, one particular example of that is what's been done on Chilton uh, with Angel Trains for to introduce a 165 hybrid by essentially ripping out what's underneath uh, and fitting uh, a couple of generator sets, uh, traction batteries, uh, replacing the diesel engine with a traction motor uh, and having a hybrid control system just as you would get in a, in a hybrid car. Uh, one interesting thing about that is that Marylebone in London must be uh, to have a uh, diesel trains in a in a uh, low zone uh, emission free zones is increasingly likely to become unacceptable. So not only is that hybrid operation, but it will operate in battery only mode, uh, and that'll be geo fenced to stop engines being used actually in uh, at busy stations and such like where the, the pollution is, is getting increasingly unacceptable. So that's quite an interesting initiative. So to summarize, if, we, if we're talking about getting to net zero, if we, we need to look at the role of each type of traction, both in the transition and on the net zero railway. And that essentially summarizes uh, what the what the rules are I'll, I'll not go into that in in great detail uh but again i'll, I'll just emphasize i think there is a need to do something in the interim uh one of the things that did recently was was looked at traffic on unelectrified routes and analyzed it to give a flavor for what sort of services there are uh and you know for example you can see from that that Rural routes for which uh, there's traffic in sparsely populated areas, which are probably ideal for for hydrogen type trains, is 16% of of the traffic on currently electrified routes, which gives it, which is very crudely speaking, an indication of the amount of energy that will be will be consumed for passenger traffic. Uh, but we've talked a lot about uh, passenger traffic. We mustn't forget freight. Uh, which accounts for 30% of, of UK rail diesel emissions. And of course, the re electrification is the only decarbonisation option for freight trains, potentially biodiesel. Uh, but, you know, when we think that an electric uh, freight locomotive is twice as powerful as a, a diesel locomotive because of the constraints on the size of a diesel locomotive. What that means in terms of the extra capacity on freight trains and actually extra capacity on the railway because one of the things that constrains capacity on a mixed traffic railway is the speed differential between freight and passenger and the time it takes to get fr freight trains in and out of loops and such like. Uh, all this electrification brings all sorts of other not so immediately obvious benefits uh, and the interesting thing is uh, that 
the CR, the Chartered Institute Logistics and Transport, their rail freight forum, they concluded that 500 kilometers of electrification, uh, which is only about, I think, 12% of the TDNS recommendations, would actually enable six, about 70% of freight traffic to be electrically hauled. So there's huge benefits there, and that's their study with the proposed routes, which incidentally uh, includes East-West Rail, uh, but uh, that's that's another topic of conversation. Uh, but certainly electrification offers huge benefits for freight uh, and only needs a relatively small electrification program to actually uh, increase the amount of traffic. In fact, one of the things, there's a reasonably high percentage of electric freight in Scotland and that could be greatly increased if a line between Felixstowe and an Ipswich could be electrified, uh, which which is, is, is interesting to see how interconnected this this whole thing is. So just to wrap up and conclude then, uh, and perhaps one thing I've not really mentioned, I've talked about electrification, but clearly electric trains aren't any good unless there is a zero carbon electricity supply. And one of the things that, as we mentioned earlier, the, 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 the decarbon, the greening of the grid uh, and the reduction in carbon density of the grid has, has shot down to the extent that over the past few years, uh, without the industry doing anything, just the reduction in emissions from power stations has resulted in a huge reduction in emissions from our electric trains. Uh, so that's clearly an important factor, but it's outside the control of our industry. Uh, we do need a large program of electrification. Uh, I think it's fair to say we need a large program of electrification, but there's lots of unknowns in terms of how future traction developments will occur. Uh, so it's probably unwise to be specific right now exactly how much is needed. Uh, we need to deploy fleet operation of hydrogen battery traction to gain experience and understand you know what makes sense because my own view is that the hydrogen battery mix might change a bit uh electrification bit is not going to change that much in terms of what's needed if we're going to do it we need to consider modifying modifications to decarbonize existing trains and and here's the thing and i thought this is one of the most powerful recommendations of the net zero report. Unless there's financial incentives to invest in low carbon technologies, such as rail electrification, the government's net zero target is unlikely to be achieved, and that's beyond the rail industry. But things like, for example, modifications to decarbonize existing trains, uh, introdu introducing hydrogen trains and such like, the carbon benefits from that need to be monetized. And finally, I make the point again, the industry has got to educate decision makers. I'm afraid I think politicians are a bit like the tide coming in, they're a fact of life. Uh, and there needs to be a way of educating our decision makers, I would suggest. So to wrap up, the future traction mix is lots of electrification, some hydrogen, some batteries. We don't know exactly what the right mix will do. We need to get started to find out. So thanks very much, everybody, for your attention. I shall stop sharing now. Thank you. David, thanks. Uh, thanks so much. So much for that. Um, right. We've now got the uh, opportunity for questions for David. Now, a few questions have come in on the chat function and actually uh, many of them have actually been answered by people out there already. So I won't uh, I won't uh, ask those questions. Um, there's a question that's come in from uh, Graham Taylor, which is how many trains does the TDNS actually suggest? Uh, I reckon the number is tiny and almost doesn't warrant all the hullabaloo. Are we focusing on the wrong thing? What so does it mean? Hydro so hydrogen trains, does it mean? I guess so. Yes, I guess it's hydrogen and battery trains in the TDNS. Uh, <sighs> I guess you're talking about a few hundred, and I think the point is you've got to consider the transition as well as the end game. Uh, so, 
you're probably talking about a few hundred. Uh, and I think one of the things I, I touched on earlier is uh, it's about the synergies. I think if, if, if it was just being done for rail, you could argue it might not be worth it. But actually what we, we will probably find ourselves doing is taking advantage of a whole pile of technologies and techniques from other industries that need it far more than rail does. So we may as well take advantage of that. Uh, and it is the only way of decarbonizing. Uh, it solves not just CO2 emission problems, but also uh, diesel emission problems. Uh, so I, I don't see any harm in trying it, but I think with all these things, you need to try them. Uh, and so, and one thing that's quite interesting about the the other side of the coin that's worth considering is that the, 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 the predictions are that there will be a huge hydrogen economy. The hydrogen economy will be worth a lot of money. Uh, and potentially it's something that if the UK gets involved in early and it could be quite an export market and such like. So what was interesting about Scotland's hydrogen train is that one of the reasons for that train is as a catalyst to kickstart the hydrogen economy in Scotland. It's about much more than, than the railway. So I think the answer to the question is if you consider it very narrowly in, in terms of the railway, the answer is possibly not. But if you consider the big picture and the synergies and and the and the role that hydrogen may well have in 30 years time, then it's right that we make a start on these things now uh, and we get fleet experience and we see how it goes. Thanks, David. Uh, a few more questions that come in, but maybe just a follow up question from me there. Um, in, in terms of that, that sort of approach between either batteries or hydrogen, automotive is clearly going down the battery route in terms of cars. And you've seen many uh, motor manufacturers are declaring a battery only future for their products. Why have they focused, do you think, in your view on batteries and not hydrogen? Well, one of the things I thought was quite interesting about the HGV study is that right now what uh, what the manufacturers, and I include the HGV manufacturers, are considering is just the vehicles. But the problem is one of infrastructure and vehicles. And, uh, you know, an anecdotally, when you speak to uh, project managers on, say, station projects, who've got to uh, have a few car, car uh, battery charging places in car parks, and what that means in terms of cost for the for the electricity supply for that as a small thing. Uh, the, the cost of providing the charging infrastructure for all this uh, is potentially huge. And as was seen from that hydrogen study, and if anyone's interested, I can recommend the, the Ricardo report that was done for the Committee for Climate Change. Uh, when you consider the, the bigger picture and the infrastructure costs, then Maybe hydrogen's got a role, but I think on on light vehicles where you don't need the same level of power, battery has, has got its role. And the other thing you've got to consider with batteries is their weight, which again, if you're not having much of a high powered operation, it's not so much an issue. But for HGVs, for example, if you're going to have a couple of tons of battery on your HGV, then that's less payload you're carrying. So the, there's there's lots and lots of considerations and I suspect the vehicle manufacturers are only considering it very much from their perspective they don't normally have to worry about infrastructure <laughs> great right we've got a few more questions coming David so uh, this one's from Simon Wadsworth uh, if the rural lines like the far north line to Serzo are made hydrogen or battery only will freight no longer be allowed to run on those lines no I mean clearly one of the things for which there isn't really a zero carbon solution on rail is non-electrified freight or departmental vehicles or whatever. And there's two options there. We could either use biofuels, which are a scarce resource, uh, take them off the airline industry because they want them because they've they've no option until they get their hydrogen liquid hydrogen planes, or or we plant a few more trees. You know, you've you, you've you've got you've got to. You, I mean, carbon offsetting measures are acceptable. That's why they talk about 
uh, a target of net zero carbon rather than zero carbon. Uh, but we've got to accept that there will be a requirement for for freight, uh, and we've got to accept that I, even I would say that it's unrealistic to electrify absolutely every line in the UK. Good. Th thanks, David. Um, uh, questions come in from uh, Sarah Randall. Uh, overhead wires are expensive and unsightly. Is third rail likely to be continued, although more dangerous? Is there another option? And I guess to extend that question a little bit further, there's certainly areas, islands on the third rail network that could benefit from third rail extensions to fill those islands in. Do you think that's a viable option? Well, I think one of the things that actually needs to be understood is the sheer amount of power you get through the overhead line. I mean, you, the power, the megawatts that you get, it doesn't look much the overhead, well, the overhead line from a distance, uh, but you, 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 at 25,000 volts, 300 amps or whatever is, is about 10 megawatts, uh, said he, doing a quick calc. Uh, on third rail, you need a substation every few miles. It's you, you've got losses. You're not going to transmit the same amount of power. It, it's it's okay in a suburban area, and clearly, infill might well make sense. Uh, but in terms of uh, wholesale moving away from overhead uh, electrification, that's not really in the cards. I actually don't think it is that ugly. Uh, uh you kind of get used to it i mean i know when it when we electrified the glasgow edinburgh line uh quite a few people said to me how ugly it was and such like but personally i think you get used to it but then I, i'm an engineer and if it's if it's well engineered rather than some of the uh uh rather excessive structures that we had on on great western if it's well engineered uh as an engineer it looks good to me but that's a matter of opinion <laughs> Yes, you may want to ask residents of Goring their view on well, that. Well, I, th I, th I think they, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's, a, unfortunately, that was, that's uh, a tad over-designed. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Um, so a question from uh, Phil Saddle here. It seems rather shocking that the decision makers need to be educated when presented with proposals supporting government targets. How can this be addressed, do you think? That's a $64,000 question. Uh, and it really is. I mean, I don't like to criticize politicians because politicians are hugely busy people with a range, huge range of things to actually, uh, to, to actually deal with. Uh, I think, the, frankly, I think the industry has done a bad job in communicating electrification. When I compare the Coucher shooter letter uh, with this 68 page report that was produced that purports to represent the industry view, I mean, you know, what I, my views on electrification, I don't think are really any different from any other railway engineer I speak to. Speak to. I, I just have a few facts, more, perhaps a few more facts at my fingertips. Uh, we need to communicate that view, we need to do it clearly, we need to explain why. I think it's it's not so much about saying what are the benefits, because you, you sound like a bit of a salesman when you're saying that. You need to explain why. And um, Simple concepts like you're taking the electricity straight from the wire and feeding it into the rails, and there's no, there's no energy conversion processes involved. And, and that energy conversion process takes up space, it takes up machinery and such like. That's the sort of thing we need to get across to explain why it's why it's future proofed. And uh, actually, there is there is something I'm working on in conjunction with uh, a few other piece, people that spells that out that we hope to get uh, support to disseminate. And uh, in a few weeks' time, I'll be in a position to give you some information about that. Okay, but it's it's a challenge, and I think all of us in the industry need to take that opportunity and be aware that we need to simply explain the reason why, and also be aware that frankly, we really as an industry messed up electrification. 
in the early stages. It wasn't necessarily anyone's fault, but we did. And you can understand why the Treasury and others think that the industry isn't to be trusted and they've got long memories. And we need to give that reassurance that we can deliver cost savings on electrification. Yeah, thank you, David. And uh, Graham Taylor makes that exact point about us all having a role to play in communications. We look inwards too much. Tell your friends, not your colleagues. So I think that builds on your point there, David. Um, question from uh, Andrew Sloan. Although hydrogen seems to be a viable solution and clearly something that the UK is investing in, there seems to be a long way to go to bring in the infrastructure. In the interim, perhaps in the next 10 to 15 years, does the industry consider that battery is the preferred option for existing vehicle conversions? Well, actually, I don't think the infrastructure is a particular big deal. As I said, uh, that hydrogen fuel station at Aberdeen uh, is not really a particular big uh, outfit. Uh, it's scalable. The hydrogen supply uh, industry is is ramping up to supply electrolyzers and such like so if you look at that picture i showed you of the of the hydrogen fueling station hydrogen fueling station at aberdeen you need something 10 times the size of that for a depot that will be uh running have a 10 trains say based uh and that's the proposal for example for teesside for example uh and that would cost you about ballpark 20 million quid uh, 2 million per train uh, for the infrastructure for hydrogen so it's, it's not I don't think that's a particular big deal it's not that difficult that, that kit is available pretty much off the shelf now okay thanks David um, a question here from uh, Alan can you explain the NH3 the ammonia diesel um, more please and any ideas about the NOx emissions compared to standard diesel. Uh, I'm not a chemical expert, but I mean ammonia is a way of carrying hydrogen, uh, one nitrogen molecule for three hydrogen molecules, and it's relatively liquid ammonia is. Let me get this right. Uh, at ten bar, you can store it uh, at ambient. Uh, pressure as a liquid or at minus 33 at one bar so you can it's relatively easily transportable as a liquid as opposed to hydrogen which has got to be uh, I think uh, 20 degrees above absolute zero for, to get liquid hydrogen uh, and one of the things one of the reasons why they're so keen to use it on shipping and it seems to prefer solution on shipping is that you tend to have a fair bit of reasonable size machinery spaces so you you would have uh, a chemical plant or process that would convert the ammonia back to hydrogen uh, to, to actually use in a fuel cell or what you can do apparently is burn ammonia directly in a diesel engine uh, with a suitable catalyst and that for the shipping industry is a big advantage because it means that you've got all these huge ships, all these huge diesel engines, and if you can use those in the interim, so that you're not switching everything over to fuel cells, uh, that's an advantage. And then maybe by 2050, you have, you, you've done that. So it provides a pathway to get from uh, from diesel to uh, to electric. I couldn't really comment about the actual, you know, noxious emissions from 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 ammonia. Clearly, it's got uh nitrogen in it so you would have nit nitrogen oxide you may need scrubbers and such like but i don't really know enough about that to comment okay thanks thanks david um a question that's come in here and i, I think it's building on your point about the scarcity of biofuels and it's from eric bates is generation of synthetic fuel made from electricity carbon dioxide and water an option rather than compressed hydrogen I think you, you've got to do the carbon maths and there's the uh, Committee for Climate Change report 
did go into that in some detail and concluded that it would be highly expensive and probably involve a lot of car carbon consumption to to generate those fuels. Uh, and that's where their, their conclusion was that at best, if you had sustainable practices for biofuels and such like, you'd be able to produce something about that is equivalent to about 14% of the amount of petroleum we produce now. I mean, that's their predictions on the basis of today's current knowledge. So biofuels are, are not a, a universal option. There's something that you could uh, do something with, and that's why that chart that I showed, that the energy flow chart, uh, scenario that was put there showed a lot of those being used for aviation, for example, because clearly with aviation, uh, you've got massive problems storing stuff uh, unless you go to liquid hydrogen, which which is actually considered to be possible because hydrogen uh, has got a lot more energy in it by weight than than diesel fuel. Uh, yeah, which makes uh, which makes sense. Um, David, that's the end of the question. So, so thank you so much for uh, for, for, for taking those for us. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Kinchin Smith to uh, to do a vote of thanks. So, uh, so Chris, over to you. Right. Can you hear me? Because I would like to say yes. So, I've got some feedback. Yeah, I can, we can hear. I can hear. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, David, for giving us a masterclass on the advantages and limitations of each of the various technologies that you've outlined and indeed covering not just rail, but road, air, and ships as well, passenger and freight. Uh, a presentation packed with data. I was busy making quite a few notes. I know it's a presentation and indeed a field you've been working on for a long time. So you're, we, we originally I hoped you'd be presenting to us at least a year ago, but I know things have moved on since then. So we've had the benefit of that. And um, I'm very sorry we couldn't be entertaining you at the STEAM Museum. Um, I've always said that Brunel would have loved 25 kV, even with overhead wires. Definitely rather better than vacuum tubes down in the, uh, <laughs> down in the forefoot. Um, lots of things I wrote down, good phrases. Decarbonisation, definitely a long-term project. But one that appears to be incompatible with DFT's blinkered approach. How, how, how can we persuade them that the Scottish example has merits for uh, the other nations of the United Kingdom as well? Do the professional engineering institutions have a role here? I'm sure they do, but uh, it seems to be an uphill struggle at the moment. Um, electrification, the only high power zero carbon technology for so much of the network. How can we get to a rolling program? How can we avoid the feast and famine that's plagued us in the past, not just with electrification, but with other parts of our rail investment as well? Yes, we need to deploy hydrogen and battery on rail to gain experience try them out and yes, show them to the opinion formers so we can show not only the advantages but the severe limitations as well. And yes, the industry has done, done a bad job living here on the Great Western. It's all too apparent, but we know we can learn from that and move forward. So all power, I say, to David Shearis and his fellow communicators on persuading those that need to be persuaded. And I'd like you all, even if only do it in a virtual way, to wave your hands, clap your hands, and show your appreciation in the usual way. Thank you very much, thank David. You, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Chris, and and thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, from myself. Um, it it just leaves me just to bring your attention to our future events, uh, which are coming up. The our next uh, session is on Tuesday, the sixteenth of March which is the uh, Future of Rail Presentations, also known as the Young Members Evening, which is a competition for our uh, young members to uh, compete in a, a presentation with uh, prize money and a chance ordinarily to compete in the final at Birdcage Walk. Obviously this year it's going to be virtual in terms of those finals. So that's on the 16th of March, it's always a, a good evening. And then on Tuesday, the 20th of April, and it builds very much on the theme that uh, David has spoken about tonight. Uh, we have uh, Mike Muldoon from Alstom talking about the hydrogen train that uh, David uh, spoke about in his presentation tonight. And he's joined by Ewan Smith from Angel Trains. We'll be talking about the hybrid uh, conversion again that uh, David touched on in his presentation. So that's symposium on the 20th 
of April also will be a very interesting event. So uh, please hope to see as many of you as possible, both for the event on the 16th, the future of rail and on the 20th. So thank you all, everybody, for joining us tonight. I think it's been a, a fantastic session with some great.